Good afternoon and welcome to Oak House Oct COVID webinar series. Today's session is Frontline Mental Health Stressors and Strategies for Workplaces. I'm Krista Thompson, an occupational hygienist with OCAO, and I'll be moderating today's session. While we intend for today to be an important conversation, and ultimately we will end the conversation with a panel discussion around strategies, there may be times where the conversation may be a hard topic for you. If you find the need to catch your breath or relax for a moment, log off, step away, do what you need to do. You need to look out for your mental wellness first, and then come back if and when you're ready. If you are not ready today, the recording will be posted in probably about one to two weeks time, so you can watch on your own time later. Before we begin, begin today's webinar, I'd like to take a moment to offer a reflection for those who have died of COVID and those who have died as an indirect result of COVID. The losses many have experienced continue to be felt and will continue to be felt. In the before times, in-person funerals or other memorial gatherings would help to begin the process to grieve to say goodbye, and so importantly, to be comforted by the presence of others. But for many in the past two plus years, COVID protocols have created an extra layer of loneliness in times of bereavement. So if you've lost someone in the last two plus years, please accept my condolences. And if you would like, would you join me in a moment of silence in honor of those who have passed? I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge those who are currently dealing with COVID, including long COVID. This illness has created long-term health effects, which we're still learning about. In fact, our last COVID webinar on March 25th addressed the emerging evidence around long COVID. If you missed that session and you're interested, the recording should be posted hopefully later this week or next week. As was discussed in that se se session, long COVID is real and it has impacted many people in many ways. To varying extents, we're all impacted by COVID in some form or another. What started as an acute stressor that turned our lives upside down has become a chronic stressor for many of us, but especially for frontline workers. It's been just over two years since the World Health Organization declared a pandemic on March 11, 2020. And it's because we just passed the two year anniversary that I had that moment of silence just a moment ago to honor that anniversary and to recognize what we've been through. It's been a long and challenging two years for many people and frontline workers have had unique stressors. Although today we're featuring speakers from the healthcare sector and the education sector, I realize that frontline work is just so much more than those two sectors alone. So I want to recognize that. As the pandemic continues to affect us all in countless ways, we have to remember we're still very much in the thick of things and we don't always get a chance to catch our breath and reflect on how much we faced. It's been a lot. And we all deserve a little bit of grace to ourselves. It's truly a testament to each of you wanting to have a positive impact in your workplaces and in your community that you're here today. Whether you're watching live or watching the recording later, you're trying to be a positive force. You're trying to be a helper in the world. So thank you for being here today. Mental health is as important as physical health, but mental health is incredibly stigmatized. So I'll admit, I'll be the first to admit, I'm not free of bias. We all have bias. I try to address when I recognize I have bias. If I say something today that is biased or stigmatizing, know that it's not intentional. So please let me know so I can correct myself and learn to do better. I always think it's important to learn from my mistakes. For today's COVID webinar, we will have three speakers followed by a panel discussion on strategies. And these strategies can be applied in many community settings. We're hoping the strategies are more broad than the two sectors that are represented today. This conversation may be hard at times, but we want to end with some takeaways that you can use to engage. Acute and chronic stressors can affect our mental health and wellness. I see many mental health professionals are publicly speaking out to their increased workloads due to COVID related mental health issues on social media and on traditional media. But these are anecdotes and anecdotes are not data. Our first speaker, Dr. Tyler Black, will be discussing what story the data is really telling us. After Dr. Black, we will have Tracy Edwards speaking on educators' experiences, followed by Birgit Umaigba, who will be speaking on her experiences in nursing. And again, as I mentioned, we'll have a panel at the end, which is hopefully where we can give you your ideas to engage that you can take away with. 
So we'll go on to our first speaker. Our first speaker, as I just mentioned, is Dr. Tyler Black. Dr. Black is a psychiatrist and clinical assistant professor at the University of Br British Columbia. Uh, Dr. Black is child and adolescent psychiatrist and suicidologist who has been in clinical practice for over 14 years. For 10 years, he was the medical director of emergency psychiatry at BC Children's Hospital. On top of clinical duties, he's an assistant clinical professor at UBC and a researcher specializing in suicidology, psychopharmacology, and video games. He's the co-creator of Hearts Map, which is at www.openheart, which is H-E-A-R-T, S and then map.ca. I will be sure to put that in the chat in a moment, uh, which is a psychosocial assessment and guidance tool for youth in emergency departments. He's also the creator of ASARI, the Assessment of Suicide and Risk Inventory, a documentation tool for clinicians who are assessing or noticing suicide risk. So thank you, Dr. Black, for agreeing to speak today. We're so happy you're here. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for the introduction. I'll try to get through this. It's, it's a lot of data. Um, I'm contactable pretty easily at dr.dr.tylerblack at gmail.com. Uh, so if anyone has any questions following this um, or want to engage in any conversations, I'm always available for that. Um, and I'm, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to speak. Um, every time I do a presentation on the data in COVID mental health and the evidence, um, I do my very best to provide the latest data. So you're going to see data that's been published within the last month. Um, anytime that there's something that comes out that has any, any relevance to the topics of mental health, I try to compile it. Um, in terms of disclosures, just to make sure everybody knows that I don't, um, I'm not getting paid for the talk. I'm not getting uh, any pharmacy or pharmaceutical funding. I'm not mentioning any branding products and I have no financial conflicts of interest to declare. Um, so when, when COVID first came out, um, it wasn't uncommon to see headlines that looked like this. Um, and I don't fault people for taking this position. Um, I think it's really reasonable to be worried about mental health at a time of crisis. But I do want to point out that pretty much every time there's been a crisis in this world from 9-11 to hurricanes, a chorus of quote unquote experts has come on TV to tell us about an impending wave of mental health crises that never come. And so this is not my first rodeo um, for this to happen. And, and so, uh, obviously, COVID is an upending event, and we now know what we didn't know in, in September of 2020 or March of 2020. Uh, here's another headline from April 2020. Um, uh, we didn't know what we now know, which is that this is going to be two years and it's going to come in waves, and the worst of it actually wasn't in Canada in the first few months. The worst was, was yet to come. And so thinking of this as an upending event that challenges our mental health and our, our, our capacities is obviously um, an understandable thing. Um, and I don't fault anyone for taking that position. I will say that, um, you know, the evidence that, that these types of life changing events, whether they be wars or famines or pandemics, cause significant mental health problems was, was shaky to begin with. Uh, but again, I, I get the link. Um, Here's more March uh, mental health tsunami, top doctor, this is obviously Dr. Teresa Tam, um, uh, expressing uh, concern over um, the mental health. And so what we had first in terms of the data um, that started to support the narrative and at this point, it's fair to say that it's a moral panic. And a moral panic is basically when society believes something and then all the research that agrees with what that society believes is amplified and the research that doesn't agree with what is believed is sort of discounted. This has happened many times in the past. This happened a bit with mental health. Um, the declaration of impending suicide, impending distress, um, tsunami of mental health concerns, all these types of things, um, uh, it's kind of taken its a life on of its own. and. Uh, unfortunately, the first research to come out are often things like surveys, because surveys are so easy to do. They're convenient. You call a bunch of people and you ask questions. And there's, there's a number of methodological problems with surveys. So the first is you can never establish cause because you're just taking a cross-sectional link in, in time. Um, if I ask 100 people during a funeral, are you sadder? Um, and, you know, I, I get unsurprisingly um, a response that most people are sad during a funeral, I don't get to actually conclude, therefore, funerals cause sadness. Um, and you can think of all the reasons why an association between funerals and sadness might not actually be proving that 
that funerals cause sadness. Uh, in fact, as was mentioned in our opening, um, funerals are a healing way to process death, which causes sadness, and um, the loss of a loved one causes sadness. So, um, when we do surveys, we don't get to see what we don't get to see, and we don't get to establish direction. Um, when it comes to surveys, uh, I think probably the best one to think of in Canada is the, the uh, Canadian Association of Mental Health Survey. They've been running a survey pretty much every um, every few months. I, I will say this graph is oddly skewed. If you follow the timeline, you'll see that this is not a proportional timeline. Like we go from July of 2021 to January of 2022 in one leap, whereas you know within the month is on this side, is on, is on the other side. Um, so it does make it the, the graph look a little bit strange, but you can see that in terms of depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms, um, there's been waxing and waning. Um, it does look like, um, as th this is true in almost all mental health service surveys, that women in, in Canada were more affected than men in Canada with respect to symptoms of depression and anxiety. And that's well replicated in pretty much everything we know about depression and anxiety disorders and depression and anxiety symptoms. Um, but it's hard to really look at this and say that there's a really clear trend. I will say that things look to kind of follow the wave of the pandemic. Um, you know, as the pandemic sort of settled down in 2020, we see rates fall a little bit. There's a bit of a swelling. You can see the um, uh, the second wave um, in late 2020. Um, and then you see there's a big lull. They, they didn't do the survey after July of 2021. I'm not sure if that's because they kind of took a break because they thought things would be over. But of course, Omicron and Delta hit um, after July 2021. And you can see another, another push up. I wouldn't call any of these changes a tsunami. In fact, this is a survey of 1,000 people. Um, and, and the confidence intervals of this survey probably would indicate that very few years or very few surveys are different from each other. This probably indicates a relatively stable pattern. Interestingly, and knowing that this is about workplace and, and workplace health and safety, they do actually correlate this to a number of things. And people who are in high exposure, high risk jobs were more likely to report moderate to severe anxiety than people in low risk exposure jobs, which is not surprising. Um, this is a little bit confounded because in Canada, a lot of the healthcare and public um, care jobs are occupied by women. And remember, uh, women are more likely to have a higher rate of anxiety and depression symptoms. Um, but at the same time, so this is not adjusted for sex, uh, but at the same time, the separation is is still there. In fact, um, uh, being ex having the potential to, to be exposed was shown, it has been shown this survey many times to be related to more moderate to severe anxiety problems. Um, Statistics Canada has been asking people relatively recently um, about, do you have a positive outlook for the future? And I'd say that most Canadians do. Um, this was taken in, in Q4 2021, so this is during the Delta surge. I wouldn't say exactly a time of pandemic optimism. Uh, this, you know, Delta was hitting pretty hard by this point and um, Omicron was yet to come. Uh, but um, Canadians reporting, um, you know, and men and women about the same, uh, that for the most part, they feel have a positive outlook to the future. About 28% or so, um, sort of 50-50 on the future, and 10% uh, rarely or never had a positive outlook on the future. So, so generally, Canadians have been, um, when when surveyed, and remember, Statistics Canada, they do demographics-based surveys, so they actually try to sample based off the demography of Canada. So this is a highly representative national survey. Uh, in the same way, they ask people about loneliness, um, and I've dialed down all of these surveys on St Statistics Canada. You have access to if you know how to, to browse their website. Um, but this is a question on loneliness, and again, the blue is rarely or never lonely. Uh, the pink is sometimes, often, or always lonely. I've dichotomized it just to make it simple on the graph. But you can see that a number of different things play into whether or not people report. So overall, it's about 50-50 for people who feel rarely or never uh, lonely versus is people who are sometimes or always lonely. But if we break it down by age, we see that young people are more lonely. Um, if we uh, break it down by minority status, people who are visible minorities are more lonely. Um, if we break it down by disability, people with disabilities um, are more lonely. And if we look at uh, people who identify as not heteronormative, uh, LGBTQ2+, in this definition for Statistics Canada, and, and plus was the opportunity to say other as opposed to hetero. Uh, 
um, and and cis, um, you can see a huge effect here where 28% um, of of um, of people LGBTQ plus um, uh, two plus uh, were were reporting. Um, not uh, rarely or never feeling lonely versus 55% of the population who is, is cis hetero. Um, so what I'm trying to add to this is this notion of complexity. Of course, whenever I'm asked what's going on with respect to mental health and, and, and COVID, I'm always asked typically by media or if someone's asking me just off the side or if I'm doing something on Twitter, I'm asked to provide a summative statement. Well, I challenge you, try to summarize this. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really discrepant. I mean, I, I feel that most Canadians, if I look at the not LGBTQ+, um, uh, most Canadians are reporting that they're rarely uh, or never lonely. Uh, but if I look at the LGBTQ2+, um, uh, uh, group, most of them are reporting loneliness. And, and so creating a summative statement is very hard. And people want to make this a nuanced thing, but it is not a new, uh, sorry, a, a general thing. Mental health is deteriorated, mental health is getting better, et cetera, et cetera. But as we get better and better data and we get better and re better research, we're starting to see a bunch of complexities. Now, in my, my neck of the woods, I'm a pediatric psychiatrist. Statistics Canada has been asking adolescents pretty much every few months, um, do you think that your mental health has gotten the same, better or worse during the pandemic? And you can see um, that for pretty much most of it, um, most kids are saying that they're the better or the same. And this is contrary to the moral panic that I'm facing daily uh, as people um, attack me on social media and media constantly get surprised by these numbers as I explain them. Uh, but the media and the public have fallen victim to moral panic, which means that every time a study talks about something negative with respect to kids, it's overhyped. But this data, which is pre presented by Statistics Canada, every three months, I don't think once has made a headline. Um, and, and there's a disproportionate bias of negative news. Um, this is relatively reassuring. In fact, the last few months um, that this survey has been done, the rate of kids saying that their mental health is worse is quite a bit lower. Um, and in fact, better is at par or higher, and the same is obviously very dominant. Um, it looks to me like as the school year progressed throughout the beginning parts of COVID, we saw increasing mental health distress. Um, and since the summer of last year, things have been a lot better. Um, of course, in BC, for example, schools were open this whole time. In Ontario, there was a split between schools being open and closed, but schools were open uh, at times here as well. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about schooling later. For adults, uh, this is a study that was done in May of 20, 20, uh, 2020. So this is right as the pandemic was starting. Um, a significant portion of adults um, reported that their mental health had deteriorated compared to before the, the uh, pandemic. Um, and much more than felt they got better, but I would still say in most cases, the same or better, which remember, if you think like a scientist, the opposite of worse is the same or better, just like the opposite of the better is the same or worse. So if the statement is most people got worse, that's categorically not true. In fact, uh, about 38% of people uh, reported getting, having their mental health deteriorate during worse and, and the majority, uh, 62%, uh, better or the same. But of course, again, it breaks down along lines of, of what was being surveyed. So you can see um, a significant improvement in mental health in the working class group. Um, uh, whereas, uh, so so here, uh, the, the 20 to 25K income group had the best parameters, um, a little bit significant outside of, of what was expected in the other figures. Uh, women were more affected with respect to negative mental health. Um, the LGBT group, uh, in this case, it was the same definition, LGBT2Q+, um, was, um, uh, was higher in terms of mental health problems, uh, disability was strongly related to mental health problems, uh, being indigenous or a visible minority. Um, uh, being indigenous was, was associated with having um, uh, more mental, pro mental health problems. Non-indigenous majorities had less mental health problems. Um, and uh, having a pre-existing mental health condition was extremely related uh, to having uh, worse mental health outcomes. So this is very early in the pandemic. 
um, and we're going to talk a little bit about longitudinal studies. So, longitudinal studies are, are superior to surveys. Surveys come with a lot of problems. You're asking a bunch of people a bunch of questions once, and they're not the same groups of people. So, even if you repeat the survey, you're not sure you're capturing the same things, um, and, uh, and it's very difficult to establish cause. Now, of course, the, the, the gold standard of cause would be a randomized control trial, but we won't ever be able to ethically uh, give people COVID or um, uh, force some kids to not go to school while others do. So we're not ever going to get the RCTs that tell us cause conclusively. However, longitudinal studies are superior evidence uh, because they follow the same group over time. And they ask repeated measures that are the same measures over time. And by following the same group over time, they're actually able to say, before the pandemic, how are they doing compared to after the pandemic? Of course, most of the surveys I showed you, even this one, um, it does say, how is your mental health before the pandemic? But they're asking people retrospectively. We're not actually really sure that this group looks like this because we didn't ask them before the pandemic, how is your mental health? What a more accurate and scientific way to determine um, when mental health starts than by asking them when you need to know, as opposed to asking them months and months later. So, uh, so, so uh, longitudinal studies are a higher quality of evidence. Um, all of these studies that I've been presenting so far come from Canadian data. So this is our experience here in Canada. Um, uh, in Alberta and Ontario, they repeatedly asked the same group of people um, every, I believe it was every two weeks, um, and they developed a model for the trajectory of anxiety. They're, they're not showing the individual scores, I think, because of, of confidentiality reasons. But you can see that depression and anxiety kind of follows a bit of a U-curve. Uh, depression symptoms um, came down below the cutoff score, uh, or sorry, not below the cutoff score, that's before the, below the mean. Um, and, and then increased again through to January of 2021. Same thing, they kind of came down and increased again. Um, again, not really pointing to a tsunami, but reporting to anxiety and depressive symptoms that change in time. Interestingly, they did break down a number of things. I found this one particularly relevant to us um, who work in healthcare, but to all who are in workplace environments that could be exposed to COVID. Um, having family members or friends, they didn't ask about coworkers, but I could probably impute this, uh, diagnosed with COVID, um, probably ramping up a lot of uh, depression and anxiety symptoms. In this case, depression scores were highly related to that. And you can see the trajectory of people who were um, uh, exposed to someone who had a diagnosis of COVID are quite a bit different. Uh, this group is a Canadian group looking at um, starting in 2020 before the pandemic. In fact, sorry, in 2012 before the pandemic, they followed them every three years and they deployed it in May of um, 2020 uh, as well, looking at middle to older aged adults. And these graphs are showing three different groups. They actually found a group that didn't increase very much. They found a group that increased moderately, and they, they did find a subgroup that increased quite a bit. And when using machine learning and, and a bunch of complicated math, they were able to determine that loneliness was high, higher. You're more likely to be part of this high risk group of increase if you have loneliness, if you've been in verbal or physical conflict. If you have a, a loss of income, if you have health related concerns, if you're unable to provide care, or um, if you have had um, uh, any separation with your family. And so these risk factors kind of put you more likely to be in this group that's blue. Whereas if you had the opposite of these things or other factors, you were more likely to be in the red group uh, that did not see an increase. So again, a very nuanced finding. If you want to ask me, what was the effect of, of um, uh, COVID-19 on middle to older age adults in Canada? I'd say, well, most did well. In fact, this group is 68% of the sample, and this group is only 8% of the sample. This group is about 30% of the sample. So this group, the largest percentage, did actually quite well. Uh, not a lot of change in their, their, their symptoms. However, people exposed to conflict, loss of income, health-related concerns, et cetera, et cetera, were, more, were much more likely to have an increase of uh, depression during, um, uh, during COVID, but I would point out that it's along a trajectory that appears relatively static. I'm not seeing a bump because of COVID. I'm seeing a continuation of already increasing scores. Um, 
so so uh, none of these to me show a bump due to COVID. They all look like they're pretty much on track uh, from where they were before. Uh, this is a, a Ontario study looking at youth um, going from January of 2020 to uh, December of 2020. Uh, just conveniently, they had set up this survey because they were wanting to follow things um, yearly. And then the pandemic hit and they switched it to a four month survey, I believe. And it allowed them to uh, capture for um, a bunch of youth their mood state, their substance use, and their worries. And again, like the previous study, they broke them down based upon what, how, what was your score where up is worse um, and down is better? What was your score um, uh, on entry? And they grouped it into four quartiles. And you can see that the high quartile group had a had an increase in their average score, negative score of mood states. Um, the middle and and lower quartiles actually pretty much ended up where they started. Uh, there doesn't there was a change during the pandemic, but it has sort of reverted back to normal. Substance use rates didn't change, and COVID worries remained about the same. And uh, by the end, you can see quite a dip uh, by the time the way the first wave of COVID was over. So youth uh, 2014 to 28 in Ontario seems to have done relatively well. Post-secondary students surveyed in Ontario from May 2019 to 2020 have a decrease of anxiety symptoms, ang um, depressive symptoms, and PTSD symptoms if they had pre-existing mental health concerns. So remember I was saying before, in the adult group, we saw um, that that was a risk factor for the students in this survey, and these were, um, I believe, U of T, Queens, and another, maybe McGill. Um, uh, depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, and PTSD symptoms came down. Burdensomeness, I spelled that wrong, my apologies, time pressures, friendship problems, they all came down significantly. Now, the group that didn't have mental health concerns saw a large increase, but before we get too alarmed of these numbers, all of these remained under the clinically relevant thresholds for the diagnosis of anxiety or depression or PTSD. So even though there's an increase, this is only a relative increase of a small number and not actually showing that like 52% of people developed depression. They did have an increase and you know I, I show the numbers as they are, but I think it's much more important to look at it this way. Um, the numbers did change in a positive direction, but all still under clinically relevant thresholds. Um, so in this survey of post-secondary students, it was against their hypothesis. They actually had hypothesized that problems would have increased in 2020. And in fact, they decreased. And they decreased in the group of students who already had mental health problems in May of 2020, 2019. Um, so uh, a very interesting finding. This extremely excellent um, addiction survey has been going every year since 1999. They've enrolled the same group of people since 1999 and have followed them every single uh, year um, for, for 30, 31 years uh, or 21 years. Um, so they are now 33. And they're asking them the same questions. Um, how much cannabis do you use? Um, how much combustible cigarettes do you use? Uh, recently, they've been asking about e-cigarettes, uh, binge drinking, uh, what's your binge drinking use like been, and your overall use of alcohol in the past year. Um, obviously, most adults drink alcohol. Uh, binge drinking came down significantly during the pandemic, and none of the other um, parameters have changed. So again, against the moral panic, which is addictions um, increasing, this excellent survey of longitudinal study of the same group of people over time has not shown that to be true. When it comes to public health data, um, this is using statistics that come through um, uh, not surveys or studies. This comes from outcomes. Uh, now, I'm a suicidologist by trade. That's what I used to do uh, full time in terms of my research. Um, and I still do a lot of suicidology. Um, Canadian suicide rates in the past 10 years, this is broken down by group. The oldest, uh, I'll, I'll show the age groups in a second. The youngest is here, adults are uh, the top three. Um, you can see that for most of the age groups, things are relatively flat for Canada. Um, so suicide rates in Canada have not significantly changed in quite some time. There's a huge decrease in this age group, which we don't understand. Um, I think it's just statistical variation, but um, it's been seen in all three adult groups. So maybe there's some survey difference or something amazing happened in 2016 that I don't know. Um, but uh, uh, you can see the overall trends are quite flat. 
Um, so let's look at what happened in 2022, 2020. Now, again, the moral panic was that suicide rates would skyrocket. In fact, suicide rates came down significantly in all groups, the 60 plus group the most at 19%, followed by the under 20 group at 18% down, then the 30%, the 30 to 59 group at 17% down, and the 20 to 29% group at 15% down. A huge drop counter to the moral panic. And yet, uh, this remains a relatively unknown statistic in Canada. Most people still operate on the assumption that um, suicide rates have increased during the pandemic because that is what the political and media moral panic has told uh, Canadians to think. Um, males um, and females both had a decrease, uh, sorry, men and women, uh, and um, uh, men had a larger decrease than, than women did. If we look at suicides by month, um, we can actually see the drop happen. Um, this is the year previous going up to December, um, and then this is the year that follows. Uh, you can see that pretty much every month is below the month that uh, that was its its year-on-year -year comparison uh, with a huge drop off at the end of the year. Um, and uh, I've done the same for Ontario. Uh, suicides in Ontario uh, followed the same pattern, maybe a little bit less of a decrease at the early stage, but a larger increase at the end of, of 2020, uh, resulting in an overall decrease of about 16% uh, in Ontario. When we looked at ER presentations for youth, uh, we actually found, again, contrary to the moral panic, that presentations for overdose accidental overdose like drug overdoses and self-harm in Ontario decreased by 16 percent in the 14 to 17 group and by 26 percent in the 18 to 24 group and this is looking at all Ontario presentations to emergency departments in the first 15 months of the pandemic so a lot of people say well you know at the early stages we had people uh, not attending because of fears of the pandemic which fair enough I, I think could be a factor but by um month 12, I think it's very unrealistic that children would not be brought to the hospital for an overdose or suicide attempt. Um, so, uh, so this is a genuine decrease that was seen in Ontario. This is relevant uh, to, to Canada and, and the province that has been, honestly, um, with a lot of the academic people in, in Ontario, one of the largest sources of the moral panic uh, has been doctors and hospitals in Ontario proclaiming a mental health crisis for kids uh, and skyrocketing ER presentations for self-harm and overdose, despite, you know, a 2022 study showing uh, that these numbers actually decreased. So when it comes overall to what's the answer, what happened to COVID, um, what happened to mental health during COVID, it's complicated. It's really complicated. It is so hard to describe. Um, a lot of people started with it's going to be a tsunami of mental health concerns. And I think I've shown with the best data we have out of Canada, it has not been that. There has not been a tsunami of mental health concerns. Um, now, we don't know what's coming. It could always be that mental health concer concerns come later. We have not seen that in previous disasters, even pre pre previous large mass casualty events. Um, but uh, it could be, so we don't know what the future holds. But the current description is that the mental health outcomes have followed different trajectories depending on the subpopulation, but overall following previous trends. I don't think that if I did a survey in 2019, I would show that LGBTQ plus uh, people were less likely um, to, to have uh, significant problems with respect to their mental health. Um, so I, I do think that there, um, this is sort of following previous concerns. There is someone who's unmuted right now. I'm not sure I'm getting some feedback. Um, the, uh, the, it's also not true, and I never want my presentation to be interpreted as everyone's okay. I've clearly demonstrated that some subgroups suffered. Um, and as we learn more and more about who those subgroups are, it's important that we target our efforts to help those subgroups. I have no doubt that we need more support for LGBTQ2 plus um, uh, kids uh, and, and adults in Canada. I have no doubt that we have gravely given, given uh, under service to the impoverished uh, people of Canada, to Indigenous people in Canada, um, and to um, people with disabilities. Uh, so it's not that everyone's okay. Uh, when we take some of statistics, what we can say is the average didn't change. Uh, but of course, within those averages, there's a lot of complications. 
but it's also it's not that things were better when it was normal either. Um, the the increasing rates of depressive symptoms in older adults was starting in 2012. Um, there was a high rate of binge drinking in adults in 2019. Um, so uh, there's a lot of this pressure to kind of go back to normal. And I, I'm always puzzled by this question because before the pandemic, we had a lot of mental health concerns in Canada. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's not true that we saw some impact of measures. Um, we haven't seen an impact of the measures that we've done to present COVID and we don't get to live in the alternative reality where we didn't do measures. There was more death and dying and everybody sort of compares the, the, the sort of counterfactual to before the pandemic. But of course, the two branches we had were, do we do measures to prevent COVID or do we not? And we lived in the universe where measures were taken. And we can't see what the universe looks like where measures weren't taken. I suspect with more death, dying, and COVID fears um, that there would be worse mental health concerns than if we hadn't taken measures. But we don't get to run that study and we don't get to live in that universe. I'll add complexity to this. In my neck of the woods, <clears throat> in child suicide, um, I've been a huge push, a moral panic to return kids to school to prevent their suicides or that kids are more suicidal because of school closures. I will point out that prior to the pandemic, so when we get talk about urgency of normal or returning to normal, prior to the pandemic, look at the cluster of suicides in kids zero to 17 this is the last 20 years in the United States. This would look exactly the same for Canada. I'm working on a study right now in Canada and it's gonna look very similar. This would look the same for ER presentations uh, to our hospitals for mental health concerns for kids. It follows the school year and the school week. Januarys and Monday uh, Mondays are the worst. Pretty much all of the school year, Monday to Thursday is bad. And pretty much all the school year, September to November is bad. And the summer is better, and the winter is better, and weekends are better. Schools are a major cause of stress for kids. And if we care significantly about increasing suicide in kids, we have to take seriously a look at uh, suicide rates during school times and stress rates during school. So here's how complicated it is. I'm not gonna read this out. Um, this was how I would start to answer the question, um, how have things gone with respect to mental health? So um, uh, when, when this question comes up, resist the urge to follow the moral panic. What you feel in your gut must be true might not be true. That's the way moral panics work. That's how the satanic panic happened. That's how uh, jazz was theorized to cause uh, dysregulated babies. Uh, that's how the printed novel was, was hypothesized in 1830 to rot the brain. If something, if something feels true, you, we still need the data to check out whether or not it's true. And, uh, and then if, if, you're, if you want a simplistic answer on mental health, you'll never get one. Try not to think of mental health in a simplistic way um, and think a little bit more about the individuals in Canada who need our protection. Uh, so I thank everybody for their time. I hope I didn't go too far over time and I'm going to give uh, everything back to the presenters. Thank you, Dr. Black. Uh, are you able to stay for the panel discussion at the end? Yeah, I'm, I will. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so very much. Thank you for presenting. I was really interested in seeing that data. I had seen some data recently that was published around um, postpartum uh, mental illness being increased. And I think that ties in nicely to the data you showed around yeah. existing conditions. Um, really, really great to see all that. Um, I'm seeing, um, not seeing any questions in the chat. If anyone has any questions, Please feel free to unmute yourself to ask now. We'll give it a moment or type it in the chat. Not seeing anything. Oh, lots to think about. Yes, there was a lot to think about there. Um, okay, so I will move on to the next presentation then. Um, oh, Sandra looked up 2016. Let's see what 2016 was. <laughs> I will move on though. Um, our next speaker is, oh, someone's unmuting. Okay, at the end, that's wonderful. We'll also take questions at the end of everything. So I'll move on to Tracy. Yeah. 